Congress and having support from the Minnesota folks telling the Minnesota delegation in Congress that that is a good initiative to pass to extend because there's some deadlines coming up, right? And was it March of 2009? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of right around the corner. It's kind of it's a critical thing that affects a lot of people and, you know, affects a vibrant community uh, right here at Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center and, you know, other areas of the state. It's really important to act on that. And so that's how I kind of got connected with that. So uh, hopefully I will have the opportunity to be there and to actually have the opportunity to vote on it and be a part of the process in a more engaging way. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. Absolutely. And I have to tell you, you know, I've traveled all over the world and I had the opportunity to go to India and to China and uh, to Turkey last year and parts of Europe, but I have not been to Africa. So I need to go to Africa. So I hope that if I get elected, I will have that opportunity to travel to Africa too, because I think that would be a very educational experience for me and hopefully you can bring my family sometime. Yeah, isn't it nice? I want to just give you a little bit of background about myself, because I go all over the place and I talk, you know, to folks and groups about why I'm running for Congress and what I think needs to be done and on issues. I'm just going to wrap out. I'll give you a little nutshell here about who I am, where I came from. Uh, okay, I represent Eden Prairie right now. I represent Eden Prairie, part of Edina, in the state legislature. When I ran for the legislature in 1994, I knocked on 12,364 doors and got elected. I was the third youngest legislator at that time, and I've been in the minority and the majority and the minority again. I was the majority leader for four years. When Tim Lenny got elected governor, I took his place as the House Majority Leader. So I've seen both sides, and I've really learned the importance of working in a bipartisan fashion to get stuff done, more than anything else. I think that is really, really important. And I say that from the perspective of a legislator who, and a state representative who has been there, and I've actually been able to pass more legislation in the minority than I did the year before as the majority leader, because a lot of people think of the majority leader as the person that's really going to take it to the other side, you know, take the team and really give it hard to them. I never used it from that perspective. I used the opportunity to build relationships, and I think that those relationships were good. You will never see my Democratic colleagues in the House. I tell you, as a person who works in the business world, I work at Target, so Target Corporation is my real life. I like to say I'm in the real world. Uh, I understand the importance of good planning and good management and good decision making and the value of customer service. Those are principles that Congress needs too right now because Congress doesn't seem to have any of those principles. In fact, I'd like to see more business people in Congress that can apply some common sense principles to some of our fiscal policy as an example. And finally, I will tell you as the majority leader, when I was majority leader, we, we had some tough budget decisions to make facing a four and a half billion dollar budget deficit in 2003, for example. We had to make some tough choices and we were able to face those down and I think we made some really good choices and because we did them in the way we handled them, Minnesota is still not only a great place to live but it is a better state because we did not chase jobs out of each state. And so I, need, I think we need that type of strength in Congress right now, you know, in terms of some belt tightening, live within your means thoughts, because you know, the economy is very fragile right now, it really is, and that's probably one of the key differences between myself and my opponent. I mean, there are a lot of tax cuts that are set to expire uh, in the very near future. In fact, the average, if, if the tax cuts all expire in a year, it's cost the average family in the third district, well, average person in the third district, $2,600 a person. It's not per family, but it's per person. That's a significant amount of money. You know, as people are paying more for gas right now, they're paying more for food because energy costs are going up, paying more for health care out of pocket. You know, they're worried about keeping jobs. I mean, I, I really think we need to do all we can do, all we can do right now in a very fragile economy to make sure we keep the economy moving. And there are challenges there for change, much than when I first got elected to the state legislature because when I got elected in 1994, it was really, how are you going to compete against North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin? Today, it's how you're going to compete against China, India, and the rest of the world. It's very, very different. It has changed very quickly and fast. And I think that Congress just keeps moving slower and slower in a changing world. I think they need to kind of catch up and keep pace. Having said that, I'll also say I do believe that energy is probably one of the key issues facing our generation right now. I really believe that because the United States has not had an energy policy in 20 plus years other than buying more oil from foreign countries. And that's dangerous from the standpoint, of not only of a national security issue, but it's dangerous because we're sending money to tyrants and thugs to people around the world that don't like us. Uh, but it's also an issue on our, our own economy. So I'm a big proponent of, of uh, searching for American oil, for American jobs, American gas. I get that, I understand that, but you can't be short-sighted. You gotta think of the long-term. The long-term is making sure we've got opportunities in alternative energy and wind and solar and biofuels 
and geothermal and nuclear energy. I think we should be looking at nuclear energy uh, because the demand for energy is not going to go away. China and India, and those about it, uh, my opponent kind of not being from the third district, right? Or down, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think the point that they were trying to make is that uh, you know, he moved to the district to run, you know, because he'd always been, he'd been living in Minneapolis, and I went to high school, I think, in Osseo, right, I believe, for a couple of years, and then, you know, moved, and, you know, he's got a good background, and I commend him absolutely for his service, for instance, and I know, you know, he hasn't been in, living in the community for very long, I think that was kind of the point that they were trying to make, because, you know, Jim Ramstead, who's the congressman right now, lived in the community, he was, he was in the state senate for a long period of time, uh, you know, work with interfaith outreach with the local food shelves, and uh, you know, like I do, I work on the A Better Chance Foundation, which helps people from inner cities, for instance, come to the Prairie School District to be integrated in the community. Um, you know, and kind of having that those roots or involvement in the community. I think that was probably the point they were trying to make. I'll tell you about the tone of the campaign. You know, that has been the most frustrating aspect because as Jim Ramstead came out last week, I mean, he had a press conference and said basically, this has been the most negative outrageous campaign he has ever seen in the third district and we've never seen this type of money come in the third district it is basically a record it's never happened before and uh it's a lot of it is scurrilous attacks you know and uh you know the good thing is is that the media has basically given you know my opponents ads a grade of an f for a d minus or that sort of thing you know what i mean that that's fine that's good but the problem is the ads still run and not everybody sees the news reports and so, you know, it's hard to take that. You know, I mean, we've had a rule in our house. We just don't have the t television on, you know, because we don't want the girls to see the negative ads and sort of a lot of the, you know, the untruths that get told. Because that, that, that's hard, right? I mean, we're hungry, you know, so that we can all understand that, like Randy said, you know, some level of help. Right. And for the fact that when we even compare, looking at like Randy, second largest, we don't even have a community center, we don't even have access to football, being, you know, these are issues, we can't even socialize. Right. And, it, it is very good enough to uh, just want to know, understand a lot of time you have spent there, what have you already done right, before right. I can go for things. Right, and even Prairie in particular. So I have more connection to that community, just in terms of working, but not the librarian community. It's only recently, when I got together with Kerper, and uh, when I was the majority leader, we helped pass a resolution. This was back probably three, four years ago. The state representative Stephanie Olson and a bunch of librarians came down to this, the Capitol, and there's a little to do, I think we had in the Capitol that day. And uh, it was only recently when I offered the resolution here in Minnesota, again, bipartisanly, with your local representatives, because they weren't doing it, so I just offered it and went and did it myself, to, uh, to urge Congress to kind of make some movement on, uh, on, the, on the status issue, you know, pushing them forward on that status issue. So that's been kind of not leading in the right way. It's frustrated a lot of Republicans. It's frustrated a lot of people in the country. It's caused problems for Republicans. It really has. It, it, it really has. And so it makes it a tougher Republican year. It's certainly made it tougher for folks like John McCain, for instance. But it makes it very tough. So, I mean, I'm very clear. You know, I'm an independent thinker. I, I say, you know, the administration has messed up on some stuff in Iraq. They've messed up on some stuff fiscally. You know, um, and they should be faulted for that, uh, without a doubt. And I think they've missed up on the opportunity to have some bipartisan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we got a Mackey chose a vice presidential candidate, Sarah Pillen. Yeah. Yeah. What's your view? <laughs> Mackey being 70 years old, who died yeah. tomorrow morning. Yeah. That's it on the fifth. Mackey yeah. took Harry. Sarah Pillen becomes the president. Yeah. What's your view on it? Show my break. Well, and I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to comment on the ticket, obviously, or anything, but I will say this. I mean, my preference, you know, when, when McKay was selecting his VP or going through that process, I would have liked to have seen Tim Pelletti. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, for a number of reasons. One, I've worked with him for a long period of time. I think he's the real deal. And, uh, you know, he's articulate. He's a future generation. He's smart. He's sharp. He's a quick study. He's a quick learner. He's independent thinking. Um, you know, I, I'm a pretty good friend of his, and we communicate and connect a lot. So I was a little, you know, disappointed that he didn't get that opportunity.